Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Thrive Today June webinar entitled Piloting Politics. My name is Christy Harang, and I am the administrator here with Thrive Today, and I'm excited to be spending this next hour with you. We are incredibly blessed to be joined by our presenter and president of Thrive Today, Chris Corsi. Chris and his wife, Jen, are the founders of Thrive Today and the creators of our relational skills training program. He's also the author and co-author of several books, including Transforming Fellowship, Relational Skills in the Bible, and Four Habits of Joy-Filled Marriages. Chris, welcome. We're glad to have you here with us today. Thank you, Christy. It's so good to be with all of you. I'm very excited about this time together. We're going to have some fun and hopefully this will be a very meaningful, inspiring time. So yeah. I'm glad to be with you. <laughs> so before we dive in on our topic, uh, we just wanted to make a quick comment and also share the heart and the goal of this webinar. You know, politics uh, is a, a tough topic no matter what, but now more than ever with what's going on in our world and our countries, we've got COVID-19 in the US, these major racial injustices. If you're from a different country, you know, you might be facing all sorts of different unique challenges. And with these big issues, uh, there can be a lot of big emotions, whether it's frustration and anger or sadness or maybe fear and uncertainty for the future. And we just want to, first of all, acknowledge uh, whatever you're bringing to this webinar and just let you know that we deeply care uh, about where you're coming from as we engage in this conversation. Um, but we also want to mention that our goal for today is not going to be to dive into any of these specific uh, political issues or take a stance or tell people how to think or feel, but rather we want to take a step back and talk about some tips for how we can actually navigate the political terrain. How can we engage, have conversations, share and listen and learn while being in a relational place and being true to who God designed each of us to be. And that's a really tough thing to do. So Chris is gonna be sharing five of our 19 relational skills that can help us to be able to navigate these things well. And so we hope this will be helpful for you and Chris, I was hoping you could uh, just jump in by sharing your heart and um, your inspiration for why you wanted to dive into this topic on politics. Yeah, so you know what? It seems like politics has become um, such a match to start a lot of forest fires in our families and our communities. Um, if you spend any time on Facebook or watch the news, like you can feel the pit in your stomach when you just see these polarized um, opinions. And, and it's... It's hard. I've heard from a lot of friends. They're just like, I don't know how to navigate this. You know, what do you suggest? So it's been a heavy burden on my heart just seeing how this is this is playing out. And um, you know what? There's no better time than now uh, to shine, to use relational skills, to be salt and light in this world. And so I really wanted to lean into some some important relational skills that'll help you be the person God designed you to be uh, for such a time as this. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. So um, before I ask my next question, I do want to mention, because the question already came up, we are recording this, so you will have access to the recording, um, and we will also have a time for Q&A at the end of Chris's presentation, so please do hold on to your questions. We'll let you know when it's time for that. Um, so Chris, before we get into the individual relational skills, is there some wisdom or inspiration you want to pass along to us? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, and as I thought about this time today, um, I, I thought I remembered um, an opportunity I had years ago, long time ago to hear from a missionary. And this missionary really felt called by God to walk through neighborhoods, streets, and really pray over the land. Like this guy was an intercessor and he just really felt called um, to do this, not only for America, but he, he actually went to a lot of other countries around the world, just praying and interceding and praying for the people, praying for the land. And and I remember one particular story he shared where he had a chance to go to Israel and he um, saw, just encountered this, a whole lot of land and he really felt like God was calling him to enter this kind of pasture. And so he climbed this fence, got through the fence, and he just started to walk uh, through this pasture, just praying, just prayed whatever he felt like 
God was really um, inspiring him to pray. And hours went by, hours went by, the sun's hot. And as he's praying, he sees um, a lot of commotion um, near a gate that was kind of protecting this property. And he saw like police cars, like fire trucks, ambulance, like he saw all this commotion. And so he started to work his way over there. And as he, he got closer to where all these people were, he saw a lot of um, the basically just these medical service providers were panicked. They were like, what are you doing? Get out of there. That's a minefield. Like you're walking through a minefield, you know, come out. And apparently this was a minefield and it was so, uh, there's so many mines in this, in this field. They just, the, the authorities really hadn't known how to approach, you know, this, this land because it was just so dangerous. And here's this guy walking through unknowingly this very active minefield um but when they asked him you know what are you doing here he said i'm praying i'm praying to the god of israel I'm praying for this land and so what an opportunity to be a witness but what a scary moment so when i think about the topics and the difficulties and the turmoil right now in our country i think about this missionary walking through that minefield just basically keeping his eyes fixed on god step mm. by step by step and that's really what we're after today christy is just empowering god's people encouraging all of you to stay connected with the living god as you navigate the minefield that you're currently going through in your family and your community and in, in your world wow that's really good thank you for sharing that chris so um with that in mind you have five skills that you've picked out that you want to talk with us about today. Um, can you tell us what they are and what do we need to know about them? Yeah, so we're going to cover five important skills today, Christy. One of them is just how to stay relational. We have an, a relational circuit in our brain, how to keep this relational circuit going and going strong, and then how to stay connected with the living God. We call that God's sight or an Emmanuel lifestyle, just mm -hmm. like the prayer intercessor. How do we stay connected with God's presence? And then how do we quiet and rest, right? We need to pause and catch our breath. And then we need to stop what's called the sarks, which is a sarks is a Greek word for flesh. So we need to stop this flesh from um, basically, you know, impacting our lives, our decisions, our conversations. This, the flesh, the results of the flesh are not good. And we're going to talk about that. And then last, we're going to learn to, we're going to talk about learning to stop for a breather. When you need a breather or you see someone needs a breather, this is a skill that has just been non-existent in a lot of our families or our communities. And there's, there's a cost to that. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit today. Wow, that sounds great. I am excited. So uh, let's go ahead and dive in with the first skill. All right, well friends, what we're after here today is really how to be the person that God created you to be, right? We are created for life. And how do we reflect that life here on earth with our interactions, our conversations, our thoughts? Just how do we do this? You know, what would this even look like? How do we be our best self, we might say? Or how do we be like Jesus, who, who did the things that he saw his father doing, who said the things he heard his father saying? How do we stay relational during this time? How do we stay resilient? So how do we, you know, stay our best selves when things go wrong? It's easy when things are going right, but how do we do this when things go wrong? And, and part of being ourselves is also being a joyful person. Doesn't mean happy that we have to have a smile on our face, but it means that, you know what, this is hard and I'm glad to be here with you and go through this with you so that we're not alone. And how do we be loving? You know, it's very easy when our relational brain goes offline to um, be hateful, spiteful, vindictive, critical. How do, we, how do we stay loving like Jesus loves during this time and kind? It's, uh, kindness is a good reflection of the heart that Jesus gave us. So how do we do that both in social media as well as with our, our uh, interactions with people in our families? So I've already mentioned these, these five relational skills, but the goal is here um, how do I put these skills into practice and the flow today? These skills kind of build on each other a little bit. And so I'm going to talk about that. And we're going to look at each of these skills in, in depth here. So 
What's neat about your relational circuit is this is kind of your brain's master switch. I also call it a secret circuit because it's there. We just don't realize it's how it's impacting our lives. And um, all of the other skills we're going to talk about, really all 19 skills that we train at Thrive Today, um, rely on the relational circuit working. And so this is kind of like your, your brain's relational engine. And mm -hmm. we... It can go on or off kind of like a dimmer switch. So when, when it's on, I enjoy my wife and my friends and my children. I want to interact. When it's off, I just want to be left alone. I just want to be on my phone. Maybe I'm in relational mode and I turn on the TV and I start watching the news. I, I now feel afraid or angry at what's happening and the injustices that are going on in this world. So then my relational brain goes off. And when your relational brain goes off, you kind of fall into enemy mode. And we're going to talk about that a little bit here. But when it's on, I value relationships. When it's, when it's off or dimmed, I just want to win. So if it's a conversation, I just want to win. I don't care how, if I hurt your feelings. In fact, I may take a little pleasure in hurting your feelings because I just want to win here. And it's no fun to interact with someone who just wants to win. Mm -hmm. We just feel like roadkill, right? Relational yeah. roadkill, basically. So when it's on, I'm fully engaged. I'm enjoying your presence, even if we don't agree, even if you have a different perspective than I do. I stay curious because I'm wondering what's going on in you and why you feel the way that you feel. Um, so I can be very compassionate with you. I'm still resourceful. I remember who I am and what's important in the interaction. I'm even creative when it's working. What's really important is when it's working, I can predict a negative outcome. So I can not only see your perspective, but I can say, hey, Okay, if I say this, that's going, to, that's going to come across very insensitive. I wonder if there's another way for me to express this. Mm -hmm. So we can predict those negative outcomes, which is very helpful when we're interacting with other human beings, especially during difficult conversations. But there's two, two forms of off mode. So that light switch goes off, that dimmer switch goes dark. There's what's called a simple enemy mode, which is where just, we're just relationally offline and it's obvious. Um, in talking to Jim Wilder, he, he had a, a humorous kind of term for this. Is this is the part, this is just called stupid mode. It's just where I say and do things that's so bad, so foolish. Foolishness would be the biblical word for this. So it's just, I've just become like, um, I'm foolish here. Because I'm so offline, my mouth is running and my filter's not working. So you can look at me, you can listen to my words, you can see my body. And you can say, well, this guy's just offline. This guy's losing it. And you, we've all seen people just lose it, right? I revert to like the, the two-year-old who's just throwing a temper tantrum in the middle of the floor because I did not get my way. That's the simple um, version of enemy mode. So we say and do things we regret. Like, oh, if I could just take that back. We react mm -hmm. in the moment. There's no filter. These are the kinds of moments where you're in a coffee shop and you see somebody lose it because they got a different coffee than they were expecting and they throw this huge fit. You just kind of shake your head and go, oh my, that guy's having a bad day. Um, we're basically relationally impaired. Your brain is not updating. So I don't see that I'm overwhelming you. I'm just running you over and um, I don't care or I don't notice. But there's another, a little more calculating form of enemy mode. It's called predatory en enemy mode. Um, it's, we also call it the smart enemy mode because it looks like I'm fully engaged. I'm caring. I'm a good listener. The problem is I'm tracking you. So I'm, I'm coming across as somebody that you enjoy, that you can trust. But the whole time my brain's actually tracking your weaknesses so that I can get something from you. It's not a very, uh, it's kind of like the serpent in the garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. That serpent had been watching them, tracking them, and appears to be very helpful, very kind. The whole time the serpent is after something. So in predatory enemy mode, I appear very relationally smart, but in truth, I'm looking for an advantage. All the levels of your brain's relational engine are working except your attachment level in this mode. What that means mm. is um, I pretend to care, but I don't really care because I'm not bonding with you because that part of my brain is not engaged in what's happening here. So I don't care if you're hurt. In fact, I'll use that to my advantage. So it's not a, that's not a fun place to be. And usually people in predatory mode, they will use um, a crisis as an opportunity to gain something. 
whether it's money or sex or whatever it is, they will use hardship to their advantage. Um, but it's, it's, it's not a good, not a good place to be. Mm -hmm. So some of us were just simply offline. I'm relationally offline and it's obvious. I'm not in relational mode. I don't have peace. Um, I'm just reacting to big feelings that I can't manage. But there's also some of us that slip into predatory mode and we're using crisis as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So when I see you hurting, I'm, I'm going to pretend that I'm caring because I want something from you. I want your trust. Mm -hmm. um, so not a very good place to be, but the question we can ask ourselves is, does this feel genuine? Um, and kind of trust your gut. Like a lot of people say, you know what? My gut just tells me something's off here. Yeah. Trust your gut. Like we want to pay attention to that. And when we're, in, when we're in relational mode, we can have a pretty good sense as to what's going on. But when we're in enemy mode ourselves, our discernment is not working very well, very accurately. So if we want to see some of what God sees in this world, we need this relational circuit working. Like this is the foundation here that we build on. So it needs to be on. And when the relational circuit is working together, this engine is working together as God created it to, what happens is your left hemisphere comes online because your relational engine is over here on the right side of your brain. When the engine's running, everything's working, this, this left hemisphere comes online and it's the left hemisphere that solves problems with communication. So I see that you're confused. Let me clarify and give you more information. That's what this wonderful left hemisphere is good at doing. And the problem is there's four levels over here that don't respond to communication. So when you see that I'm hurting and you try to give me more information to fix my problem, I'm going to feel very frustrated with you because I'm not feeling like you're listening or you're hearing me. And so one of the skills that we teach at Thrive Training is helping people learn what's happening at each level how do we intervene when somebody is stuck there? So many of us just have relied on communication to try to solve problems and it doesn't always go well, but we don't know why. We just think, well, maybe they're not ready, right? Or maybe they just need more faith. You know, we throw these really good um, reasons out there, but it just doesn't really pass the peace test. So we want the relational engine working together but I want you to have this lens today that there is a time and a place where words and communication work. That's, that's the easy, low-hanging fruit. But there's four levels over here in the emotional brain that words and information just don't really touch. So that's where I might need an example. Show me how to handle this. Or I might need you to attune with me so I feel understood. Just hear me out. Or I might not need you to quiet with me because I'm really upset and I just need to settle down if you'll just sit here with me. Or I just need to be connected with somebody that I love. So we're not going to go into a lot of depth today, Christy, on all those levels. But the point I want to make is when you're in relational mode, you'll have a better sense as to what's needed in a moment right. and what's not helpful because I can put myself in your shoes. And so it leads to more productive, even conversations, right? Because this was like a light bulb moment for me where our logical brain is not going to function properly if our relational brain isn't on. And so if we're having these intellectual conversations, we're going to keep missing each other if we're not in a relational mode. And they're really not, there's no productivity. It's, it's kind of like having a futile conversation in a sense. That's exactly right. And that's what happens. And then we leave the conversation scratching our heads like what went wrong? What did I say? You know, and what we don't realize is we were falling out of relational mode trying to stay connected with someone. It's kind of like, you know, when you travel on the airplane, you got to keep your oxygen mask on you first during turbulence before you help the people around you. So learning to stay relational, learning to keep my relational circuits on is really foundational. Um, to how our interactions will go both with during good times as well as during the hard conversations and the hard times. So um, we don't want people to feel disconnected and misunderstood when we're trying to interact with them. And sometimes that just means when you notice somebody is getting upset, take a moment for quiet to say, hey, could we just pause for a moment? <sighs> Do we catch our breath? So Start to monitor, am I relational right now? Am I just feeling like, you know, I just want to win this argument. That's a good sign you're falling out of relational mode. Mm -hmm. 
So we want to be good listeners. And when I'm curious, that's a good sign that my relational brain is working. And that's a, that's a very good indicator. I'm curious, why do you feel the way that you feel? Um, because the goal here is we want peace. Like many of us, many of us feel hurt and afraid and angry right now. And anytime we focus on what upsets us, it puts our brain in enemy mode. So if I think about, you know, I'm watching the news, I think about what's going on, I get angry at people, that's very easy to slip into enemy mode. So as Christ followers, what that means is we can learn to quiet, we can learn to talk to Jesus about what's going on. And we're going to talk about that here with the next skill. But seeing some of what God sees becomes a crucial skill to navigate these times. Because mm -hmm. fear is good for usually like under two minutes. Like Fear is not a good long-term motivator. We don't want to stay stuck in fear because the fear centers in the brain are not relational. They're actually part of uh, what happens in enemy mode. So if I'm motivated by fear, I'm afraid of what's gonna happen or I'm, whatever fears might be driving me, um, it's good for about two minutes. If I touch a hot stove, I move my hand. It's a, you know, if I see a car coming too close to me, I move out of the way. Like fear can be very good for a short term but it's not something we want to stay stuck in for the long term. And mm -hmm. part of a byproduct of unprocessed pain is fear. So when I have like wounds from my past that are getting triggered and activated in the present, then usually fear is going to be a part of that. And what happens is when I feel afraid, I might try to change you instead of like noticing what I need in this to disarm this fear. So a lot of the times I'm afraid, I'm going to tell my wife, you know what, you just, just, don't do this anymore and we'll be fine. Like just, you know, put the dishes away and we'll be fine. Or, you know, whatever it might be. It gets pretty crazy when we think about it. But our brain can come up with a lot of reasons where we're trying to navigate our fear. Uh, it's not really helpful. And part of what we all need to learn to do is recognize where is, you know, where's some of my pain sneaking into this present? Because I've felt this way before. I feel out of control. In the present, this reminds me of when I was, you know, seven years old and such and such happened. And so Carl Lehman has written a very good book called Outsmarting Yourself, which talks a lot about what happens when unprocessed pain is sneaking into the present. And the result is, is fear and big reactions. So staying relational is really the life preserver, the relationship preserver that we need um, in order to navigate these tough times because even if I have some pain sneaking into this present moment if I can stay relational I can even verbalize it like wow I'm noticing I've got I'm getting some strong feelings here because this is reminding me of other times in my life where I felt misunderstood or unprotected so could we just could could we just t pause for a moment I want to invite Jesus into this or you know what is it we need when big feelings come in that that would be a very good question to think about what do you need? Who is it like you to be when you have big feelings come in? Awesome. That's good. So that's a million dollar question right there for everybody to think about. Well, that's good stuff on staying relational. And again, one of our skills. And then you're going to get into another one of our skills, which is so crucial in this topic. And that is God's sight. So talk to us about this. Yeah, so this is really the game changer skill because what God's sight means is I start to see things from God's perspective. There's a term out there that Dr. Daniel Siegel kind of came up with, which is mind sight. Mind sight means I look at your face and I try to interpret what you're thinking or what you're feeling. So mind sight means that I, I know there's a person behind that face. In about five months of life, infants gain this, start this mind sight skill where they realize, oh, there's a person behind mommy's face and she has feelings, right? There's, there's more going on here. So mind sight is I look at you and I say, wow, you look tired today. Or, you know, you look like you're, you're not happy here. What's going on with you? So I'm learning to interpret what is on your face because I understand there's, there's, there's a person behind there with feelings, thoughts, desires, dreams, fears. So God's sight is then, okay, what does God see when he looks at the situation? So what I see when I look at the situation our country is in, wow, it's scary. There's a lot of hurt. I feel hopeless because I don't know how it's going to change. But when I invite God into that, well, Lord, you know, and here's what I see. I'm curious what you see. 
Like, where are you, God, in all of this? That brings in the God sight skill. So we're, we're turning to Emmanuel to show us, Lord, what do you see here? What's going on? How can I pray? How can I join you in what you're doing in this world? Because from my perspective, it's, it doesn't look good. But mm -hmm. Lord, what do you see? And when we interact with the Prince of Peace about these things, his signature, his effect is peace. So that's what we're looking for here. So we're looking for God's peace, God's perspective, God's presence in what's going on, even with people that I'm not getting along with. I might have a different opinion than them. And it really makes me mad that they just can't see a different perspective. But Lord, what do you see when you look at this person? How are you praying for this person? How would you like me to interact with them? When we, when we start practicing those skills, it really changes how our brain sees things. And that's what we're after here. So the Bible talks about seeing things according to the flesh, which is the sark, which we'll talk about here soon, or seeing things according to the spirit. So God's sight is, is referring to seeing things from God's spirit, seeing things in a new way from God's mm. perspective. It's kind of like when Stephen was being stoned, right, in Acts. In the midst of that, you know, tragedy, he sees heavens open and he sees Jesus. And then he's able to intercede for the people who's throwing the stones at him who want to kill him. Like, that's just such a beautiful picture of he knew there's more going on here than meets the eye. So God's sight says, you know what? This is a bad situation. These people are going to kill me. But Lord, what do you see here? And what are you up to here? What would you have me say or do? And so the cool thing about God's sight is the, the fruit, the result of God's sight is it, it, it often leads to intercession, repentance, restoration, peace, all of the good things that we really want to see in this world. Um, that's what happens when we, when we enjoy the God sight skill. So very practically, like all of us probably have fears. So we can compare our fears with God's mind and God's thoughts. We say, Lord, I'm looking at this situation and it scares me. What do you see when you look at this? What would you like me to know here? And so we can start to share our struggles and our pain and, our, and the difficulties that we're in or feeling with Emmanuel. And God's sight will basically bring out the shepherd in all of us. You know, there was a point where Jesus looked at the Israelites when they were going out into the wilderness. They were hungry. They were desperate for a king. They were hurting. They were tired of the oppression of Rome. Jesus looked at them as though they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he had compassion for them. So God's sight brings us compassion, which I would also say it basically puts our brain back into relational mode which is a wonderful thing, but it brings out the shepherd in all of us. And that's what we want, Christy. We want, we want to call out the shepherds in God's people during this time to lead and to guide, to love, to pray, to intercede, to forgive, to bless. Like this is a time where we need God's shepherds. Uh, the world is a, is a hurting place right now. That's beautiful. It makes me think of, I had a falling out with a friend um, shortly after I graduated from college and she wounded me very badly and did a lot of really hurtful things. Um, and I was able to forgive her as much as I could. And a, a couple of years later, God began to give me God's sight. He began to show me more about her heart and what she was going through. And I remember it just softened me so much and I had so much love and care and compassion for her and I wrote her this big note of apology for the, the part I had played it and all and what was beautiful about it was I she never once apologized to me and I I had no offense after that none wow. um, my heart was so softened toward her and God did that because he was able to bring me to a place where I could see it from his perspective and I was able to sincerely let it go um, so it is a powerful a powerful thing to see things the way God sees them. You know, that's a great example, Christy. That is, that is really what we need right now. You know, especially when there's been pain for generations and generations. I mean, we really need some of God's perspective, God's healing, God's peace. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it really is the game changer. Um, and the fruit, part of the result of seeing some of what God sees also means that we can rest. 
So when we can't see God, what God sees, we're not sure where God is in a situation or a relationship like you shared, Christy, the, it's hard to rest. In fact, when we think about those things that upset, upsets us, we don't rest when, there's, when they're not resolved. Your brain will, the first thing to go um, with pain like that is that we don't quiet. So when we're still, usually it's when we're in bed, our mind starts going because it's the first time all day that we've actually stopped and we're quieting, that's when your brain says, oh good, this is time to think about all these things that bother me. And right, because <laughs> your brain's trying to resolve this stuff. And so that's when we tend to get the racing mind that keeps us up for hours on end. When we're so tired, we just want to fall asleep. So rest and quiet is a very important skill. You know, resting and quieting is, is on-demand release of serotonin, which helps us feel calm and peaceful so we can just be still. And so quieting helps us. We actually learn to quiet because our family teaches us how. So it's a, it's a very relational activity. It just means, oh, good, you're here. Now I can rest and be still. So it's the people who know how to quiet are the ones who help us. And the way that we learn isn't by talking about it. The way that we learn is by doing it, by practicing. And so this is the, a much needed pause in our day in a relationship, in an interaction. Um, I've interacted with people who are very upset and even very upset with me at, at times. And it, they're really upset. They're in enemy mode. They're just kind of attacking. I, sometimes I will just do this and say, I want to hear what you have to say. Like, this is so important right now, but you know what? I need a breather and I bet you do too. So let's just pause for a moment and in those interactions where we take a pause and we quiet it, it basically helps both of us to get back into relational mode and then have some meaningful dialogue and conversation. So we, we just have to pay attention to, wow, this is a good time. I need some rest because right now I'm forcing it. I'm feeling the pressure. I'm, whatever happens in you when you don't rest, we want to start paying attention to those things. So thinking, okay, I'm going to take a moment. It's the absence of rest that will keep us in enemy mode. So think about that. It's when you don't rest, when you don't quiet, when you don't turn off the TV or, you know, when you don't put down the phone, it is the um, absence of rest that will make it very easy for your brain to go into enemy mode. Then we're grumpy, we're irritable, we're sharp, we're not our best self. So practicing rest, it's kind of like you have to do it purposefully at first because it just doesn't happen by itself unless your family was just really good at resting. So in our family, we actually have to like, okay, we're going to take some rest now as a family and we're gonna quiet. We're gonna be very purposeful about it because we all need it. And we're also susceptible to bad decisions when we don't rest. So we're, we're not going to be the best version of ourselves when we don't quiet. And so we can all kind of think about this, like what hinders you from quieting? What hinders you from resting? Um, for many of us, it's just our families didn't do a very good job. My family turned to TV as kind of a pseudo rest. That's how my family kind of rested. So we can think about, you know, what, what hinders you from resting? Is it because you just never had those good examples? Um, or for some of us, we feel like it's just unproductive. Like we have to push through and push through and get all this work done. Well, brain science tells us that some of the most productive work you'll ever do happens after resting and quieting or when you quiet in the midst of your, of your work. And so a lot of these big corporations now are starting to, uh, to, to get this and starting to include like rest breaks for people to just go rest. There's a couch now, there's couches and mm -hmm. recliners in the office so people can just go to a quiet room and disconnect for a little while. So really good for your brain, really good for your relationships, but it, you know, most of us kind of have to be proactive and purposeful about this skill because it just will not happen on its own. Um, and as much as I love my phone, because I can shop with my phone, I can talk to my family when I'm traveling with my phone, a lot of research emerging on just how your brain gets hijacked um, and bonds with your phone that even when your phone is turned off and put away, your brain's still thinking about your phone. And so I talk about this a little bit in, the, in my Transforming Fellowship book, but just how we're now, technology is wonderful and amazing in many ways, but it does kind of change our brain in, in some unhelpful, unwanted, unexpected ways. 
it just means we have to be, we have to work that much harder to be able to quiet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. Cause I think I mentioned it, we had a webinar on rest and quiet last month. So people can go back and check that out if they want to hear more about that topic. But I think in our country, we exalt working hard, but resting is not something that is, you know, looked upon as a really great thing to do. I think sometimes we think it's laziness or whatever, but I think when you see how important it is, it, it can shift our perspective on it and the value we place on it. That's so true. And, and I hope that all of our uh, friends who are with us today are watching this on video. You know what? Just, just practice it. And I usually encourage people, look, put a notepad next to you. So if you're trying to quiet, but you have these racing thoughts, just write them down and go back to trying to quiet. Um, so just try to be practical, make, you know, get comfortable. A with a little bit of practice, your brain will start to crave that quieting and then you'll want to do it more often. Awesome. But, but we have a little more insidious uh, problem here, Chrissy, which is another skill called uh, stopping the sark. So, as I said earlier, like the sark, uh, sarks is, Greek, is a Greek word for flesh, all right? And Jim and the life model changed the spelling to sark with a K so that these, so that the scholars among us will look at this in a new way because um, when we look at just, we can, we can kind of lose the richness of what, what this word means in the Greek and what it means in scripture. So basically the sark, is the the seed that was passed on from Adam and Eve when they were tricked by that serpent, that master predator, and they ate the fruit, the forbidden fruit, the knowledge of good and evil. And it says, the Bible says their eyes were opened, right? And so the sark, and then they had a whole new um, perspective of what was good or what was bad, what was right, what was wrong. Because first and foremost, they noticed they're naked. And so we now see God's children hiding from God. They, they also hear him walking. They go hide. They realize they're naked, which they've always been naked. It wasn't a big deal. It wasn't a bad thing. But it becomes um, kind of a shameful thing after they eat the forbidden fruit. Then they're hiding from God. So before that, they would run to God. They would look forward to that time and that connection with God. But here they're running and they're hiding. Um, and so you see this change in their behavior, this change in the relationship, this change in their thinking. So the sark, the flesh in the Bible is not a good thing. Um, Paul talks a lot about the role of the flesh and uh, Jesus talks about the flesh and basically the flesh gives birth to flesh. The, the flesh gives birth to death. So when Adam and Eve's eyes were open, they were now introduced to death, which was something that God did not intend for his children to ever know. So the Sark is now, I'm seeing things from my vantage point, from my understanding, from my point of view, instead of God's perspective. So I now have a, a sense of right and wrong, um, good or bad, without consulting the creator on what he sees. And um, the SART can be a pretty deadly thing if we think about it. Like all of us have been on the receiving end of the SARC where somebody, someone else feels like they know what you need or what you don't need. And they might even throw in some good scripture to go with it to back them up. Uh, but the result of the SARC is you, you don't feel good. It doesn't bring peace. You don't feel understood. Uh, the life model, um, you know, kind of compares living from the heart that Jesus gave you or living from the sark. So living from the heart Jesus gave you is, is seeing with the eyes of the spirit and hearing and being connected with the living God. Whereas um, seeing from the sark is just uh, seeing things without God's perspective. It's kind of like Job's friends. You know, <laughs> they had an opinions and perspective on Job, like, Job, you did something really bad here. Like, surely God's punishing you for some sin. And the, the, you know, you better just repent because that's what you need because God's mad at you, right? So from their perspective, and if you read the book of Job, it's very compelling argument. Like it sounds very spiritual, very biblical in, in many ways, but we see at the end, like that did not impress God in the least. Mm -hmm. God is not impressed with the sark. And we see Jesus um, really battled a lot of sark 
He had a lot of sark attacks when he was walking on the earth as well. Like these were the most biblically trained Torah observant teachers in the whole wide world at that time. And they didn't recognize Jesus. In fact, if you really watch the interactions um, that Jesus had with the Pharisees, for example, you're, you'll see that they did not, did not go well. He was not impressed with their understanding, um, with their knowledge. So we also see Jesus um, encountering the Sark. It's a, it's a Sabbath. There's a woman who's been crippled for 18 years. She can't, she's, cannot stand straight up. And he's in a synagogue and he heals this woman. And she stands up for the first time in 18 years. And the synagogue ruler basically blasts Jesus for saying, you know, you can't do this. This is the Sabbath. And you can read that story in Luke 13. But we can see the result. The real result was profound healing and joy and glory to God for what he did. The synagogue ruler was, was very unhappy with that plan. And, and that did not impress Jesus, from what I can tell as well. So the more biblically trained our sark is, the more dangerous it is. Um, because the fruit of the sark is condemnation, judgment, legalism, self-justification. It just goes on and on and on. The result is I feel misunderstood by you when you use the sark. I feel alone. I probably feel beat up because you're kind of beating me up with the Bible or your knowledge of the Bible, but it doesn't have God's spirit or peace in what's going on. There's a, one way of looking at it, Chrissy, is there's no mutual mind when people are using the sark. I'm not feeling like you're in this with me. You're kind of standing on the shore while I'm drowning and you're accused, you know, you're saying this is what I deserve because I'm drowning without helping me. So it's not a good feeling. It's the presumption that I know the right thing to do, or I know the right way, but I'm not consulting, consulting the creator in my conclusion. So being right becomes more important than the relationship. Um, and Jim Wilder wrote this amazing article on the Sark. It's in Relational Skills in the Bible, the book I wrote with Amy Brown. We, Jim's has his article in there. He also wrote it for the Pandora problem. Um, it's about, you know, how knowing the right thing to do and the chances that we can know the right thing to do in a given situation. Um, he estimated it was 10 with 1,450 zeros behind it. That's the chances of knowing the right thing to do in a situation. So if you want to learn about that more, I encourage you to, to read the article that Jim wrote. It's fascinating. But it basically says, apart from God, we're going to get lost in the weeds. And so mm -hmm. this is why we need true God sight. God sight is seeing some of what God sees. The Sark is just seeing from a fleshly point of view. So we have to humble ourselves, friends. You know, I, I can't say that I have all the answers. There's times I need to just get on my face before God. And I need to invite my community to speak into the blind spots that they see um, and the areas of my character that still need some growth or some healing. Um, one way I can recognize the Sark in myself is there's usually a, a lot of energy behind it. Like I just, I feel this way and this is just how it needs to be and everybody just needs to do this and you know, everything will be fine. Like we need humble, um, just humility before God, inviting God's spirit, inviting people who know us to join us and help us to find those blind spots that might be robbing our joy or robbing the joy of the people around me. That's really good, Chris. Thank you for that. Yeah, so this leads us to our last skill. Yes, we have just a few minutes to uh, cover our last skill before we get into some Q&A. All right. Well, friends, this is the take a breather skill I mentioned earlier. It's just knowing when to stop because I see my anger is overwhelming you. All my talk, talking is overwhelming you. So I might, I might take a deep breath. I might lower my voice. I see that some rest is needed here. I'm not going to push, push, push. The Bible compares us to dust, a fleeting shadow, flowers, grass. It means our strength is limited. We all need rest, right? And so when I see that you're getting overwhelmed, I pause. I turn it down. I back off. I stay tender with weaknesses in, in others as well as in myself. Um, when I don't have the skill, I just run you over with my intensity, my anger. I don't stop. People feel like relational roadkill when I'm done with them because I've never paused so that they can like recharge. I'm just intense in your face. 
going, 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 and that's not good. This is one of the skills we train through the, tr the tracks of Thrive. It's a really hard skill to train because we all have had encounters with people who didn't know when to stop. So there's usually pain around the corner from those moments. Then we can all think about those. Those aren't our best moments where someone did not stop with us when we reached our limit and we needed a breather or when we didn't stop with someone else, right? There's a cost. So I, I wanna encourage all of you, start paying attention when you see somebody might need a breather. Maybe they back up, maybe they, their face looks frozen, they're holding their breath. For me, I hold my breath. I kind of brace my stomach muscles when I need a pause. I'll go, wow, I'm not breathing very deeply here. Could we pause for a moment? I just need to catch my breath or Hey, it looks like I overwhelmed you when I did this or when I said this. I'm really sorry if that overwhelmed you. I'm going to turn it down. I want to take a breath. Uh, this is the skill that builds and restores trust in our relationships. That when I see you've hit your limit, I will respect it. And I say, well, maybe we should finish this conversation another time. I, I, I feel like I'm running you over with my intensity. What do you need right now? So it's in the front of our minds where um, we see people need a pause or they need a breather. Mm -hmm. And so the big picture redemption here for all of us, the silver lining and what the hard stuff that our world's going through right now is our brain is the most open to new information and ec new explanations during hardship. So it's when there's hardship that my character and, and my explanations are the most open and receptive to updates. So there might be something that God wants to do in me that I didn't even know I needed until I'm, I'm going through some hard stuff and I have to cry out to God and reach out to my community for help. So the question is, Lord, what are you up to here? How can we participate with what you're doing? You pull out any of these five skills that I've mentioned today and it will perpetuate enemy mode. So if, if I'm not seeing some of God's perspective, if I'm not stopping, if I'm not resting, right? All of these things will basically keep me and easily allow other people to go into enemy mode when they interact with me. It's like if you're talking to someone and suddenly they say something, they're defensive or they say something sharp and jagged to you, then suddenly you, you notice a change in you and your head rises up and you get angry. Like that's, that's what can happen when we shift into enemy mode. So can we stay in relational mode even if we don't agree Mm -hmm. Right? Do we really want to have this tug of war and debate on who's right or wrong? Or do we want to honor the heart and curiously seek um, to understand the pain behind the issues? Like, let's start hearing each other and understanding each other. What's going on in you? Like, I want to know. I want to learn. I want to be part of the solution for what's happening. All of us have a story. Every single person in this world has a story. And we can learn to understand those stories as we interact with people. And your brain thinks in terms of stories. So I've heard uh, Donald Miller, a great author and speaker, talk about how our brain thinks in stories. So your brain's always looking for good guys and bad guys. So how can we stay connected with the living God to see one another as God sees them? And how can we participate in what God is up to in this world, even in these dark, scary, painful times? Like there's still a living God. How can we participate and join him in this? And Christy, I know there's some questions people want to have. I want to give some time for questions or thoughts. Yeah, we're going to get to questions in a second. I just, I just love what you said, though, because I feel like we're at that crossroads right, where we have an opportunity to either grip on to what we think and believe and dig our heels in, or we have an opportunity to take a breather and to learn and grow through this and be humble. And so I just thank you for everything you shared because I think it just gives us a really good grid and lens of things we can do to be humble and to, to grow through this. So um, yeah, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So we are gonna get into some questions. A couple have already come in. You can put those in the chat box. Um, just click on your toolbar for Zoom, click on chat, type in your questions. Uh, we will field as many as we can. We wanna mention a few quick resources before we dive into that. Um, if you're new to Thrive Today or you would just really like a helpful resource about the 19 relational skills um, that we teach at Thrive Today, 
I highly recommend Chris's book, Transforming Fellowship. It has a chapter on each of the skills. It's an easy read. It's going to overview the skill for you, why it's important, um, how to recognize it, that sort of thing. So I highly re recommend that you have that um, as, a, as a tool for you. And then if you want to dive deeper into implementing these skills, relational skills in the Bible is a Bible study, and it actually looks at these skills through the lens of characters in the Bible. Um, great study you could do on your own or with friends. So I highly recommend that for going deeper. You can find those at the website above. I'm going to put these in the chat box, and these will also be sent out in an email. So if you can't get all of these don't worry, <laughs> we'll give you all the links um, in an email tomorrow. Um, next slide, Chris, we have um, Jim Wilder has some fabulous talks on the SARC. So Chris touched on this today. Um, it's an important topic, a little bit difficult sometimes to wrap our minds around. So if you check out iTunes or Amazon, um, volume eight and volume 22 of Gem Talks are fabulous um, with some more teaching on this topic. And there's also a free download on Life Model Works. Um, so you can put, or you can check those out. Um, and again, I'm gonna put these links in the chat in a second. But I also wanna mention that Amy Brown, one of our Thrive trainers is gonna go deeper on this topic of the SARC this Saturday with our online practice community. It's a three hour live interactive training. I highly rec recommend it. It's got fabulous teaching, but she also leads you through exercises so you can put what you're learning into practice right on the spot. Um, so again, that's this Saturday. If you can't make it live, you can register and receive the recording. And we also have an online practice community that she did on called High Altitude that you can get the recording of that talks about God sight. if you want to dig more into that. So um, sorry, let me get these links in really quick and then we're going to dive into the questions. I'm sorry that I didn't get yeah, this. And as you do that, I'll just say these, you know, these are great resources. Um, it's our, our explainer in the left hemisphere really likes to understand these things. So it's, I highly recommend these resources. Um, just, it gives you more information to navigate this terrain as well as just the, the books really will give you some practice. The relational skills in the Bible is a great way to practice these skills um, in our communities with family and friends. So really excited about that book. Uh, Transforming Fellowship just starts to unpack but some practice and exercises, but not as much as relational skills in the Bible. Awesome, thank you. Um, so Chris, uh, one of the questions was the challenge for me is to walk in unity without compromise. It's a great question. In the midst of ministry outreach, I think it's imperative to be honest. I have a very close friend whose beliefs and approach are 180 degrees different than mine. I think it's important to acknowledge that we may not be able to rem remain uh, relational and a, I, in a close relationship in this season. Agree to disagree, but not walk side by side. Any thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, so I think that's a great um, point. Um, you know, Paul talks about living at peace. He says, live at peace with others as much as you can, as much as it depends on you. So I think that's a great approach. You know, the big question is, who is it like you to be under these conditions? And it's like you to be honest. It's like you to have integrity. It's like you to see some of what God sees. Um, so for me, as with that context, it would be how do, how do I navigate this to stay true to who God created me to be? Um, but how does God see that person? How can I be praying for that person? How do I stay relational as much as I can, as it depends on me? How can I do that under these conditions? Um, and that is kind of the, the big challenge for all of us. Who is it like you to be under those conditions? We're usually pretty clear on who it's not like us to be, right? It's not like me to lie. It's not like me to um, deny God. It's not like me to like you. We can get clear. We can climb the mountain up that side and basically say, who is it not like me to be? Well, I'm not doing these things is not a reflection of who God created me to be which then leads us to the other side of the, of the mountain. Okay, well, who is it like me to be? What are those qualities? What would it look like under these conditions? And for many of us, we're learning as we go, right? Many of you are just learning as you go, but the goal is with each opportunity, we're increasing in wisdom and we're becoming clearer on who it is, who we are and who we're not. And how do we reflect Jesus under those conditions? So that's, yeah, that's a really good, wise approach there. Great. 
Another question, how can I su successfully encourage someone else to stop being in enemy mode toward me? Hmm. Well, the first thing you'd want to do is try to stay in relational mode. Um, and then with your personal style, how would you handle an interaction? How would you respond to somebody who's in enemy mode? So with my personal style, it, I would say something like, you know, I can see you've got some strong feelings about this. Like, what do you need when you feel this upset or you feel this way? Like, what helps? Um, so I would start the conversation just acknowledging, yeah, you know what, this is obviously a really tough situation, but I see you feel very passionately about this. Like, what helps when you feel this way and what doesn't help? So my goal is to stay relational so I can have creativity, I can stay resourceful, I can be kind, I can still have compassion, I can be curious, like all of those things will give you clarity on who is it like you to be when somebody is in enemy mode. Um, and how do you express that under those conditions? But before I would connect with that person, I would talk to Jesus about what he sees when he looks at this person. How does he pray when he intercedes before the Father on this person's behalf? And that really helps to give us a really good lens as we go into those times with someone who we might even be able to predict is probably going to be in enemy mode. Sounds good. It sounds like you're to setting up the best environment possible yeah. for them to be relational with you. You can't force them to be relational with you, but you can set them up as best as possible, you know, make the environment as good as it can. Yeah. And, and knowing, you know, these, I can operate under these conditions, but when it gets over to this level now, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to handle that. That's when I need to, that's why I need to stop. I need to rest. I can't, you know, so we even learning like how much can I sustain before it's like, no, nope, my engine's in the red. If I don't pause now, this isn't going to be pretty. So I'm going to have to go get relational and remove myself. So That's it's just true. clarity across the board when we can stay in relational mode. Very good. Um, what's the best way to respond when a fellow believer uses the Sark against us? Kind of similar question, but. Yeah. Well, you know, what comes to my mind is, is Jim Wilder wrote a book called Passing the Peace. And what I like about Passing the Peace is it's, for me, it's a good gauge. Like if somebody's using the Sark with me, um, wow, does this, because I can, somebody who can say something hard to me can still bring me peace. So I'm like, yeah, that resonates. I don't like hearing that, but ah, yeah, you're right. You know, I, that, I definitely need to work on that. But when somebody's using the SARC, um, you don't feel understood that just the peace is often missing. So I would, it would be like me to do is to just acknowledge that, you know what, I appreciate what you're saying here, but it, it doesn't, bring me peace. And I've learned over the years that when God speaks to other people, even if it's something that's difficult for me, it, it still has peace and it still rings true. I wonder if we could bring in some other people to help us with this, because it seems like we're stuck, because I don't feel like this is really reflecting God's heart. So it would be like me to put words to it, stay relational, stay kind, but even invite, like, you know, I just, I think we might need some, some input from some friends to help us with this. So how would it be like you to be when someone's using the SARC? Um, who is it like you to be? How would you verbalize it? What would you do? Um, all of those things. Those, are, those would be good questions to ask ahead of time and get some of God's peace going into it. Like, okay, when this happens, I, I think if I handle it this way, that's a good reflection of who Jesus wants me to be in this, in this relationship. That's really good. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Um, how about emotional teens? Any advice for where to start with helping teens with this? This is coming from some parents who have been through life model classes and other Thrive studies. Well, you know what? You're going to have no shortage of opportunities to practice relational skills under those conditions. So, you know, part of it is who is it like you to be as a parent with the teens? Um, it helps to know teenagers when their brains are going through all the rewiring uh, process that the teenage brain goes through. It's really hard for teens to quiet and the the teenage brain is there's just a lot of changes going on so a good reflection of who you are under those conditions would be helpful like what is it like you to do what's needed like some teens might be high energy responders so they need to do something moving so we're gonna we're gonna connect by going for a bike ride or some teens they're low energy responders so they need to they need some quiet and turn down the volume the goal is the human brain wants to feel seen, understood, 
valued and validated. So if you're going to navigate that terrain with, with your children, your teenagers, you want them to feel seen. You want them to feel understood. Even if you don't agree with whatever it is they're saying, they want to feel seen. They want to feel understood. They want to feel valued. And they want to feel validated. And it doesn't mean I can validate what you're feeling without agreeing with your conclusions. Right? Mm -hmm. So that would be kind of the approach I would think through when I am looking to interact first, what does each child need? Cause they're going to have different preferences. Are they high energy or low energy? Let's meet them under those conditions. And then what can we do to help them feel seen and understood and, and really try to make sure that we are um, seeing them and understanding them. Doesn't mean you have to agree, but it does mean that, Hey, we want to be connected in the midst of this while we learn how to handle this stuff. Yeah. And then they don't feel alone as they're processing through everything. Right. Yeah, That's it. And the moment they feel alone, everything's going to get harder. So we want to avoid attachment pain is what we call it. Like you don't want them to feel alone because that's going to make everything more uh, combustible. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we are going to wrap up. Chris, someone asked if the slides are going to be available. Is that something that we're able to make available? Sure. To people? Um, I'll put a note in the email that goes out and you can email me um, if you want the slides and then I'll, I'll get them to you that way. Yeah, but awesome. just want to thank you so much for all of you viewers for coming out and watching with thank us. You. Those of you who are watching the recording, thank you. If you have additional questions, um, you can reach us at info at thrivetoday.org. Chris, thank you so much for this. Uh, so many helpful things for us to chew on. And yeah, I hope that you guys keep digging in more. Hope you'll join us on Saturday for the online practice community. And we look forward to seeing you at another event. Yeah, so thank you, Christy. Appreciate you. Thank you for all your help and bless you friends. I hope that you have a good rest of the day. All right, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>